All right, so we're going to wrap up, wrap up chapter three. Um, first thing, notice in blue, please make sure that you have um, either turned in in paper to um, your teacher, chapter three, lesson four, or that you submitted online for those of us that are remote learning right now. So we have chapter three, lesson five, which is going to be a little bit longer of a section. There's a lot of things they just kind of put together and wrap up this idea. Um, I will try to go in as detail as I possibly can um, and make sure that I give you the notes that you need to know for either your homework and or um, your upcoming test. So once again, we're going to take two days to teach this lesson. Um, so you can either do it all in one day since it's going to be on this PowerPoint video, or um, you can break it up into two different days on taking your notes and take a break. The third day will be for you to do your assignment. Um, and then I will have your study guide available to you. Your test will be over chapter three, lessons one, two, four, and five. So here we go. When I start looking at the idea of biodiversity, I wanna know first and foremost, what in the world does biodiversity mean? So I kind of talked about it when we talked about the biosphere and I introduced you to the word, but we didn't go into detail with what we were talking about. But it's the idea of the number or the variety of species that I have in a very specific area. If I look at the world in general, then I have millions, literally millions of different type of organisms. That's plants and animals. Um, but then when I start looking at biomes, we talked about how biomes are going to have similar climates, but also similar organisms, but not the identical organisms. So per country, if, such as Australia, we find some really strange organisms there. So biodiversity is going to be depending on where I am, the type of climate that I have, um, and also how big the space is. Because if I'm looking at an acre versus a million acres, then I would expect a larger biodiversity in the million acres. When I look at Indiana um, and our biodiversity, then I have a wide variety of things that I find you know, particular to not just Indiana, but to that deciduous forest biome that we live in. We have all sorts of different types of deciduous trees, as well as pine trees. But then when in our fields, because we are a farming community, then we see the corn, soybean, wheat, alfalfa that grows. Um, so there is biodiversity in our crops. And then we have a wide variety of biodiversity when it comes to our birds, from small finches to cardinals, which is our state bird, to the robins that show up. And we have different scavengers, such as skunks and possums and raccoons and different types of fish, such as bluegill and bass and catfish. And then we have all sorts of other creatures, herbivores and carnivores. Um, and then we even have some of those rare species in Indiana, like the American bald eagle, which its population has definitely been increasing over the past 20 years in Indiana. And the uh, bobcat is beginning to start uh, to increase in its numbers back in Indiana as well. So our biodiversity is uh, unique for ourselves. I don't see the majority of these organisms if I travel down to, let's say, uh, Texas or New Mexico. So in our area, we have a unique so when it comes to um, biodiversity, then we talk about how in specific areas um, we have an economic value as well as an ecological value. So just the value of being able to have a habitat is the idea of an ecological value and what that brings. The economic value is, well, what kind of uh, you know money comes from the idea of us having a variety? So in Indiana, once again, going back to the idea that we are surrounded by um, farms, then we have an ecological or economic, excuse me, value because we have a biodiversity. We can grow different types of plants in Indiana because of our growing season um, and the mild temperatures that we have up until we get to winter. Other aspects of that between the economic and the ecological is the idea that we have different organisms, not just us, but other organisms that rely on our biodiversity for food and materials. Um, an idea of material, we've talked about the trees and using the trees to help us grow things, but we also have a biodiversity like in the Southeast where they grow cotton and a lot of cotton. And it's that cotton that they give to the manufacturing companies and that's how we get our socks and our t-shirts um, and our shirts and our blue jeans. And we use that cotton for a major source of clothing and other materials. The idea of biodiversity providing us with medicines, there's all sorts of natural remedies um, and 
um, herbs and supplements that are out there, but some major medicines also come from the basics of our environment and our ecosystems. Um, you know, it's hypothesized that out in the middle of the tropical rainforest where we have never explored all of the different um, organisms um, and trees that are out there, that maybe there are cures for things like cancer and different diseases. But there's a lot of products that provide an economic value to the idea because we have a biodiversity and we continue to strive to sustain that biodiversity as we live in our environment. When we look at the idea of food then, some people are more um, nature um, focused, so they do their hunting and they do their fishing. Um, you know, if I, you know, I love to fish, I, I'm not a hunter, um, I can hunt, I just don't enjoy it, um, but I, catch and release when I fish. If I want catfish, then I just go to the store and I buy some, you know, catfish, um, or I'll get it from, you know, somebody that has definitely some clean water around here that um, I know and that I trust. But then we have the idea of our corn and our uh, different grains and our wheats, um, and that's how we get, you know, our flour and our cornmeal and things like that for um, us to use in our daily lives when it comes to food. With materials then, we not only have the plants, but we also do have animals. So these are two different hides. It's a cow hide and a deer hide. And there are many things that people use to make um, and to construct using the hides of an animal. Um, that way, animal doesn't go to waste. But there are some animals, such as a sheep, that you don't have to harm the animal. It grows this big, thick wool coat, um, and then you shave it off when the temperature is warmer. And then you have, um, you know, a material that you can make different types of clothing and cloth out of. And then that idea of medicine, once again, Eli Lilly does use some of the biodiversity um, that we have in our area as well as around the world to try to find some uh, natural things that are out there to help us cure some of these diseases that um, are taking lives way too early um, in our society. But there's another act, aspect to this, and at the bottom you'll see that it talks about um, eco-tourism, which is probably a word that you really aren't familiar with. Um, it's ecos ecosystem tourism, which is what the book tells you, is the two words that come together for eco-tourism. And it's the idea that you can go to places like Africa and go on these safaris and pay to go around all of these natural wild animals. Um, now, it's not always safe. Um, some of them have been attacked by these different animals because they don't like being bothered. But it's the same idea that if I drive down to uh, Cades Cove in Tennessee, um, which is one of my favorite places to go, you can drive around that small area and you can see hundreds, literally hundreds of deer, uh, and occasionally you can see some black bear. It's that idea of that area is going to provide some economy by giving you a tour so you can see their natural environment. Now think back when we first started talking about these type of things with the ecology, we started talking about food chains and food webs. Um, so there are in many different biodiverse areas, um, a specific organism that causes all sorts of problems to a food web um, if it's removed. Um, and we don't want to interrupt the natural flow of an environment. Um, so we're talking about a keystone species, and it's that keystone species, that one thing um, that is going to help and influence um, the survival rate of the other organisms, plants and animals. And it's not always necessarily just for food. If I look at the idea of the butterfly, the butterfly will help pollinate um, the different flowers uh, when it goes and gets the nectar. So it's going to be helping um, not just the food web, but the um, continued cycle of the biodiversity. When I look at Indiana um, and we look at ketone, keystone species, uh, it's kind of surprising as to what our keystone species is because it's not something that you see very often um, unless you're out at night. Um, but a lot of people are a little worried and scared about them and don't think about how important they are to the Indiana biodiversity. But the uh, scientific word for it is the Myotis sodalis. Um, we'll get into scientific names and why one is capitalized and why one isn't um, here in our next book. But the Myotis sodalis is a very small Indiana bat. They, uh, the scientists of Indiana, the ecologists say that 
this is one of the most important organisms um, to our biodiversity that keeps many organisms continuing to survive and um, be productive in our environment, even though we don't often think about it. So should you happen to get a bat in your house, which I had one over the summer um, that got in my house, then your goal is to catch it and let it loose and be gentle with it. Now on page 110, <clears throat> excuse me, our book introduces us to a keystone species that a lot of people didn't think about too often early on in our country. Um, and we're talking about the sea otter. Uh, remember that the river otter is a smaller creature um, that's found in freshwater and the sea otter is located more in the estuaries um, and along the uh, ocean so shores in the Gulf and in bays. So the uh, sea otter is one of those that they would live around what is called a kelp field or a kelp forest. And we've talked about that and what that looks like. It's a plant that will uh, have its root system in the bottom of the um, intertidal zone and get sunlight um, and provide you know, oxygen um, and a habitat for several different organisms. But as they lived around there, then uh, in the 1800s, early 1800s, people started using them uh, for their fur. Uh, natural fur was one of those things that was very popular for many, many years um, and almost centuries. Hasn't been as popular in the past few decades, um, may come back around, but um, they were very much desired for their furs. And before we really understood the damage that we could do um, to an ecosystem, then we had trappers that were going in and just um, harvesting as many sea otters as they possibly could, taking their furs, and then um, expensive clothing was made out of them. Well, the problem is, is that sea otters love to munch on sea urchins. And as the sea urchins came in um, and overcrowded, they started destroying the kelp fields because the otters were not able to keep the urchins um, reduced in their numbers. Well, without the kelp fields, then the entire ecosystem there in that environment was being throw, thrown off and the biodiversity was being thrown off and people who were surviving um, and making their living off of the different organisms that they were getting in these um, narrative zones, they were losing their money and they were losing their livelihood. So um, when I know that sea urchins are being eaten and their populations are being kept um, at a minimal by the sea otters and I've taken out the sea otters, that keto keystone species being removed is causing all sorts of problems. So they passed a law that banned the hunting of sea otters and that population began to grow once again. Um, my understanding is that they had uh, almost depleted all the sea otters in these regions to where they would have been in today's date and endangered species. Uh, but now they have been protected and, and they are um, in good numbers. So we have a balance to that biodiversity in those um, southern areas. So when I look at biodiversity then, not only do I have these keystone features that affect biodiversity, but I have several other little aspects that they clump together in our book. Um, so when we look at them, they say, well, you know, other things that are gonna affect our biodiversity is climate, the area that we're talking about, niche diversity, genetic diversity, and extinction. So the rest of this section really focuses in on each of those things in small amounts. So these are really introduction ideas that you'll get more into in seventh and eighth grade, um, but to make sure that we have a, a good foundation on what we're talking about, um, we'll go through them. Then I start with the idea of climate. And climate we know is the amount of precipitation and the average temperature that happens in a given area. Once again, you know we can expect two inches of rain um, in the desert um, over a year's period, but it doesn't mean it will rain at all that year, right? It's just an average. But it talks about how when I look at climate and the effect of climate, such as the tropical rainforest that we know has a lot of precipitation and a lot of sunlight all the time, then not only um, does it keep it warm and we have these large trees, but the biodiversity is incredible. Tropical rainforests are the number one most diverse area of all the worlds that we have ever studied. Because of those constant warm temperatures, 
because of that constant precipitation and moisture and humidity that is in the air, it allows growth to happen all year long. Plants can constantly grow, um, the fruits, the vegetables can constantly grow, the flowers can constantly grow, and therefore there's this constant food production for herbivores, constant habitat for all animals, but since the herbivores are able to have a constant food supply, then they're reproducing, and therefore the carnivores and omnivores also have constant food supply. So when I look at the biodiversity then, we not only have many different species, but then we also have what is called subspecies. So we have several different types of parrots, um, not just parrots. Parrot is a biodiverse group, but then I look at the different types or subspecies of parrots, and it's incredible the different things that I find in the tropical rainforest. But the key to uh, allowing for all of that difference in biodiversity is the so area is the second aspect that affects um, the idea of biodiversity, which I mentioned earlier on um, when we first started talking about this um, lesson, but it should make a lot of sense. When I look at um, areas, I would think the smaller the area, the smaller the amount of biodiversity. The larger the area, the larger amount of biodiversity. For example, if I look at Shade State Park in Indiana, it's a rather small area, when it comes to the overall state of Indiana. It's actually rather large. If you've ever gone and uh, walked around it and taken the, the trails and things, it can take you several hours to get through the trails and around the park. So it's a fairly decent sized um, area. So I would expect a somewhat okay size of biodiversity compared to my backyard. It's definitely gonna have more. But when I compare that to the Appalachian Mountains, which Part of the Smoky Mountains is of, that's not really very comparable, is it? That little green dot um, is Shade State Park in Indiana compared to the size of the Appalachian Mountains. We would assume that there's going to be a whole lot more biodiversity in that large area, especially with all the different states um, from the cooler temperatures of Maine and the East Coast all the way down to um, Alabama and Georgia. Um, that they go through. So the larger the area, the greater the amount of biodiversity. And then it talks about the niche diversity. So when I look at the amount of biodiversity, we know that, um, as the book tells us, the, the largest biodiversity amount comes from the tropical rainforest. Well, the second greatest amount of biodiversity um, is the uh, coral reefs. So once again, when I look at my niche, we talked about that earlier on in our books. A niche is um, how you fit in into your ecosystem, into your environment, into your habitat, and the role in which you play. Um, when we look at comparing those ideas then and how the coral reefs are going to work, we have warm water anytime we have a coral reef. But not only do I have warm water, then I'm exposed to some direct sunlight. Um, and these organisms, the amount of these organisms that happens is absolutely amazing, right? So we're talking about the neritic zone. So we talked about fisheries in the last section and I used this map and we said it would make sense that close to the um, continents are going to be fisheries. Well, I'm gonna remove some of those sections. Um, so when I remove some of those sections and I look specifically really close to the continents themselves, out in the middle of the ocean, I don't have coral reefs. But along the continents themselves, I can have coral reefs. Now up north in the Arctic, we don't have coral reefs because it's not warm enough. Coral has to have um, warm temperatures. So we're really looking at those center sections along the equator where the coral reefs are. And they are the most fabulous places to go. Um, the most beautiful one that I've been able to uh, snorkel um, and be in is over in Maui um, when my father-in-law took uh, the missus and I over there, uh, I think about six years ago. Um, I've been snorkeling down in Florida um, and it has some very neat colors and aspects to it, but when you went to Hawaii, the colors are even more immense and the uh, biodiversity is even greater. Um, the area is um, pretty deep when you get to the outskirts of the um, islands itself and it uh, in the bay in which I was snorkeling I literally swam and snorkeled with a sea turtle that was bigger than I was 
That thing was massive. But the biodiversity is allowed because of the sunlight, the warm temperatures, um, and the shallow er areas of the narrative zone in which you can find. And all of these are real pictures that are taken um, by a scuba diver um, for, as he goes around the different areas of the world. The greatest, the largest um, coral reef that you can find is what is called the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and if you can't tell, because it is at a different angle than what we're used to, this is the northeast side of Australia. Um, it is the largest um, coral reef that you are able to find. Unfortunately, it is in danger um, right now from different pollutions and global warming. Um, several parts of it are dying. But when I look at it um, from a closer standpoint, it has these open valleys in which water flows openly from the ocean, but then the uh, more shallow areas is where you have your coral reef. And the variety of organisms that you have there is amazing. The size within itself is amazing. Small coral reefs are very common around um, the United States um, and around Hawaii themselves, but you're not talking about nearly as large. This is 1,429 miles long. That's a great distance. Um, to be able to have one consistent coral reef with all the biodiversity that it would have to offer. Um, in measurement then, that equals 133,000 square miles. That is uh, this amazing area for different organisms that you usually don't find anywhere else in the world. The idea of genetic bio diversity, excuse me, we're not going to spend a great deal of time on this because we get more into it in the next uh, book and then it, when we get into health. But genetics is the concept that every living organism has what is called DNA located inside of their cells. So inside of our cells, we have the um, soft outside part um, that has a cell membrane and all the different parts on the inside, mitochondria, um, endoplasmic reticulum, we have several different things, but inside, the very center is the brain of the cell, and that's called the nucleus. And inside that nucleus, then, we have what is called DNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid. The DNA is what genetically tells you if you're going to have brown hair, blonde hair, blue eyes, green eyes, brown eyes, how tall you're going to be, how wide you're going to be like me, um, how dark your skin is, you know, everything about you is coded inside of your DNA. And every single one of your cells inside of your body has its own identity of DNA. Everything in the world that is a living organism has DNA, even a bacteria has DNA inside of its one cell organism. So it's the idea that we are genetically prone to be able to adapt and to be able to do things um, in our environment around us. And the greater number of uh, cells, the larger the body usually, such as the blue well. Um, but it's the DNA that gives it its diversity um, and its different adaptations in order to survive as well. So then that takes us into the idea of some things that we have done and caused in our environment when it comes to affecting our biodiversity. Um, extinction has three different categories that it looks at. The idea of extinct means that it's just simply gone. It's no longer there, and there's no way to get it back. Um, the whole concept behind Jurassic Park is, you know, the dinosaurs are extinct, but they're able to find and harvest DNA through mosquitoes that lived during the dinosaurs and created di dinosaurs. Um, that is not scientifically anything that has been able to be done up to this point. You know, who knows what happens in the future. But then when they're not completely gone, then we get into endangered, and then we get into threatened, and we look at the different levels in which we're talking about. But extinct is extinct. It can no longer be there. It can no longer be around, and we can't get it back. And probably one of the most famous um, first recorded extinctions that happened was on the uh, Indonesian islands. There was a bird called the dodo bird, um, and the explorers um, would kill them and eat them, um, and then, you know, they would eat the eggs and destroy the eggs, but it was the only location that you could ever find the dodo bird. Um, and when that last egg was uh, stepped on by a sailor um, and destroyed, then that is a bird that was removed from our history um, from that point forward. It can no longer be found again, and it can never come back, unfortunately. 
So when I look at other organisms, then in our lifetime, we have things like um, the Western black rhino. Um, I know when Larry Batson came and he had heard about it, um, the last one being killed and poached um, for its uh, tusk, he was quite devastated. Um, that happened in 2011. Um, an island called Pinta had a specific type of tortoise. And in 2012, it became extinct. Um, the Formosan clouded leopard became extinct, extinct in 2013. And what we see when we start studying these different animals, they uh, are we have animals going extinct every single year. The eastern puma was quite popular in the um, southeastern part of the United States, and now it has become extinct within just the last couple of years of your lifetime. But unfortunately, we can't get those organisms back. They are just simply gone. So then we get into the idea of an endangered species, and that's a species that the numbers keep dropping. Um, and if something doesn't happen dramatically, um, they are going to become extinct. And once again, once they're gone, they're gone and we'll never get them back. Um, as of right now, if we look at the um, company that's in charge of keeping that list, we have 41,415 species that are on the endangered list, which means 41,415 different type of living organisms that if we don't do something about it, they could disappear from this earth and never return. When I look at endangered species, there are things like the Sumatran tiger, which is a smaller tiger compared to the Bengal tiger. Um, and we have the Tarsier, which I think is one of the most adorable little creatures um, and kind of creepy at the same time. The Liberian lynx, um, it's a small type cat. Um, the Asian panda, which, uh, you know, growing up always thought pan panded bears just always look sad and adorable, um, but they are endangered and uh, in trouble. The Indian pangolin. So um, for some reason uh, in the past couple of years, someone decided that the scales from the pangolin can be used to help treat people with medical issues. So people are going in and just killing these organisms um, these pangolins, um, which is an ancestor or a cousin to our um, anteater, um, and just taking them for their scales. So they're killing the organism only for its outside shell and then letting it die. Um, you know, there are all sorts of different things that we'll talk about when it comes to rules and laws, but it's just realizing that the world is there for us to use, but to abuse, it's going to cause some major problems. The idea then of threatened is the numbers are low. They're not close to being endangered and not close to being extinct. However, we're seeing a trend where the numbers are declining and they're not bouncing back. So once again, extinct means they're gone um, completely. Um, endangered means the numbers are, not, numbers are low and could go extinct. And threatened means we've got to do something so that we don't have to worry about them disappearing from the earth. When I look at threatened, then we have several different organisms um, from around the world um, that, you know, add to that biodiversity, but also add to the beauty of different areas. And if they're gone, they're gone. And then we have to worry about, well, what happens to the rest of, you know, the organisms that rely on those that we may not be aware of. Um, so it's one of those issues that we may not be able to do much for areas like Asia and Africa that have these unique organisms that are disappearing, but we can do things in our own area um, to help try to prevent the organisms from disappearing from us. And then we get into uh, the last section, which is how we as human beings um, have caused some problems to biodiversity. Um, and the first one that they introduce is the idea of habitat destruction. And we talked about, um, you know, when we go in and we clear cut things, um, then we have caused our own problem. So the first thing that really has impacted the idea of animals becoming extinct um, and endangered is because we've gone in and we've taken the land and we've destroyed the land uh, for our own purposes. And I'm not against using the land by any means, but trying to protect the environment is also important to me. Um, when I clear cut a forest, um, you know, I'm not telling lumber, lumberjacks how to do their, their business, 
Um, and these companies, they have literally thousands of acres and they only harvest certain areas every year. Um, so they have their plan because it does save them money. It is safer for, for their workers. Um, luckily, in the United States, these um, lumber areas, they have woods around them. But you still have the organisms that are taken out of their homes and they have to adjust and move and go to um, competing for a new home and water and uh, food supply. But there are some areas that they just clear cut and they just destroy these habitats. And as those, uh, especially in Africa, as the rainforests are being destroyed and cut down daily, what's being done about the organisms that are disappearing off the face of the earth and are never going to return? But one of the areas in which we um, continue to affect is in the south. And we've seen the um, bad aspects of what happens when we do this, but we have all sorts of wetlands. So if you think about um, the Mississippi uh, watershed, which we talked about earlier on in the book, we know that we live in the Mississippi watershed and the water is going to run down in altitude. So we have um, our smaller rivers in Indiana that are going to lead down eventually into the Mississippi River, which will lead down into Louisiana. Well, it's around Louisiana where a lot of these um, land areas are marsh areas. So the water um, is constantly sitting in the land. And some developers go in and they drain the water out of the land, which is what they're doing there. And then they start to fill it in um, the next year with dirt and let the grasses grow and um, they start to build sod. Um, but once that happens then, then they build things like this factory. This factory is built where a wetland was. The factory brought thousands of jobs to the local area down in Louisiana, which was a good thing for their economy. But at the same time, it destroyed the habitat for uh, several different plants as well as animals um, with those different organisms and their biodiversity. One of the things we found out um, when uh, Hurricane Katrina happened um, was that when we had all these areas that used to be able to absorb the land and we had these flood areas um, happening is because the land could no longer absorb the water that was happening and all that excess water. Um, so they've actually gone in since then and broken up some of the um, areas that were lower populated that had been trained and drained and turned them back into wetlands so that nature itself can absorb the water um, in case that situation ever happens again. But we also will have um, fragmentation and fragmentation is when, um, such as this, you can see the outlines of certain areas and how um, some of the areas are cleared for different purposes and different things, but then they leave specific areas alone. So we had a large wooded area where they took out the trees in most of the sections for farming, um, you know, and for to use the land, but then they left sections of the woods um, to grow and to have a habitat remaining. Now, it's not nearly as large as it was, and the biodiversity is not going to be nearly as great because we've shrunk in the wooded areas, but they at least left part of the habitat for those organisms to continue to survive in. But the idea of habitat fragmentation is when we break up different habitats. Anyway, they break up those sections into, as the book says, isolated um, or individual pieces. Um, one of the uh, most disturbing aspects for me um, is a, of a person that loves nature is the idea of poaching. And poaching is the illegal hunting and selling of organisms. A lot of times it kills the organism, um, but there is a live poaching um, black market out there where they will um, capture different species from nature and then sell them even though it's illegal to do. Um, but it's it's not um, legal um, it is watched over by our government. It's watched over by other gov governments. Our government um, will have fines and uh, different amounts of jail time and even prison time. Um, in other countries, um, they are pretty harsh about it. If they catch you poaching, then uh, they basically poach you. If you kill a you know an elephant for its tusks, then <laughs> your punishment is a quick and sudden death uh, when it comes to poaching. Um, you know, but that's what happened to the black rhino was they wanted its tusk. So you had this organism that uh, was a large animal that they killed just for its horns that were on its nose. And they do the same thing to elephants. They kill the elephants for their tusks. And um, the poaching of tusks um, is a huge problem.
in other countries. Um, and it's, uh, you know, one of those that they constantly try to reduce and watch over. But when you're talking literally hundreds and thousands of acres, um, it's hard to watch all of the different elephants or rhinos um, and keep them protected. But it's not just killing the organism. So, you know, there's a uh, chimpanzee black market where if you want to buy a chimpanzee and have it as a pet, um, which is not wise, um, they, they can become very dangerous um, as they uh, be mature and get older. Um, but then you also have companies that use them for uh, medical treatments and stuff. So there are people that go into the wilderness, into these jungles, and they um, capture chimpanzees and sell them, um, you know, for companies and different people. One of the things we've definitely talked about is our pollution and how our pollution causes all sorts of problems in the air and in the waterway and in the land. Um, so as we continue to add pollutions to the waterways, then organisms um, are going to die. The biodiversity is going to be affected. As we continue to add pollutions into our air, then we're going to be causing problems in biodiversity. Organisms are going to end up dying. They can't survive um, when their habitat has been polluted. But we've also done damage with ourselves by uh, polluting the air and causing problems with the ozone layer and um, our global warming issues. And, um, you know, one action leads to all sorts of, um, you know, issues and problems uh, throughout history. Um, and the last idea is the idea of exotic species. So uh, we have native species in our areas, plants and animals. But when an exotic species comes in, then it doesn't belong there. And when it doesn't belong there, then it doesn't have, um, nature doesn't have a way to protect itself. And it doesn't have usually like a natural predator um, or organism that's going to eat it if it's a plant. And so therefore we have them causing all sorts of problems. So we had said that, you know, um, several years ago, an individual had let uh, many Burmese pythons loose. Um, so he wouldn't get caught with them. Um, into the Everglades of Florida. Well, now these Burmese pythons, because they don't have any natural predators, have grown quite large and become a major problem, um, killing alligators and deer and many other organisms that naturally exist in Florida. So the state of Florida hires people to go in and hunt um, and give them a reward for um, size and number of Burmese pythons that they can catch because they don't belong there, and they're just causing a major problem to the biodiversity, but also to the ecosystem and the food webs. One of the issues that we are seeing in Indiana that started several years ago um, is the emerald ash, borer, uh, ash borer beetle. Um, it comes from the Orient, and in the Orient, they have natural um, predators, different birds that eat them. But in the United States, there are no birds that recognize that beetle as food. So when they got into some wood and brought over here to the United States, they have quickly devoured, not just in the United States, but also Canada and in Europe, um, many ash trees. And that's what they do is they go in and they bury and they lay their eggs and then uh, the larva will just devour and kill these ash trees, which we use for, for common wood on a daily basis um, in the U.S. If you ever go down to the Smoky Mountains, then you have this uh, particular vine that somehow has gotten into the Smoky Mountains. Somebody doesn't know um, exactly how it got there, but they don't have a way to keep up with its growth. And it's constantly just growing over and taking over areas of the uh, deciduous forests um, in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and they, the state states have gone in and tried to just cut them out and burn them out and stuff. But then you have all of these other trees and stuff you have to worry about. So it has been a major problem and one that because it's an exotic species, it doesn't have natural herbivores that are going in and eating them. It doesn't recognize it as food. So then we talk about how can we protect it? What can we do? Right. So we have what's called captive breeding. If you follow the Indianapolis Zoo, um, which I do quite often, um, it seems about every two, three years they have a new giraffe that's being born. Um, and giraffes are kind of in that threatened category right now. So if the more giraffes we can uh, produce, um, then you know, the greater the chance that the population won't just be depleted. But captive breeding allows us to raise different organisms and hopefully increase um, 
the likelihood that these organisms will be able to continue to uh, replenish themselves. But the idea of a wildlife preserve is it's an area of land where animals are protected and hunting's not allowed that will allow them to grow. So in Africa, there are different areas for gorillas and there are different areas for elephants where they are fenced in and protected um, by basically game wardens that will keep poachers from coming in and killing them, but hopefully to regenerate the population of those organisms. The book shows this picture um, of a specific type of goose that was left and abandoned. And so this family basically raised it from the very beginning. And there's an older movie um, called Fly Away Home that is based on this family that um, they take in these injured and strayed uh, baby geese and raise them and they teach them to fly because without a parent teaching them how to fly, they don't know that they can fly. Um, but it's a pretty good movie. It's an inter it's an interesting watch if it's something you definitely want to um, look at. And then another thing that uh, it talks about how we can protect our biodiversity is using land wisely. So the book shows you two different images, and it says you know this is basically the same area of the country. Um, one is for cap. Now they are different seasons. You can tell because of the grass, but they keep the um, buffalo separate from the cows, um, they have the cows fenced in, so they only graze on a certain part of the land. They let the buffalo have open ranges. They let open waterways happen for the buffalo. So it's just being able to set up the land and use it properly um, so the biodiversity can continue to grow um, and you know be there for our future. But we can also pass laws. So we have the Endangered Species Act. Um, and the Endangered Species Act um, was passed in the U.S. and has also been adopted by many of the countries in the United Nations, um, where the buy, the sell, the trade of things that come from threatened and endangered species um, is no longer allowed. So we, we do not um, bring in um, things made out of real ivory. We have imitation ivory, if people like that look, um, that's made out of different plastics. Um, but if, if you're caught owning ivory, then you get a fine. Um, if, you find, if you're caught trading in ivory, then um, it's usually a fine in jail time. But it's the idea that we're trying to do our best to protect these organisms. Because once again, it's not that they're raising elephants and rhinos to get their tests. It's that they're finding them in nature and killing them only for their tusks. And they leave the animal there to die and rot. Um, there, there's no benefit to that at all. Uh, we have uh, habitat preservation, so we have a way to set up and protect. I mean, this is the greatest thing that we can possibly do um, to keep our animals from becoming threatened, endangered, and then eventually extinct, is making sure that their habitat is always going to be there. It's the idea that if I cut down a woods, I'm going to replant a woods, even though I'm going to use the original land that I cut the trees down on. Um, but in order to protect that biodiversity, then you know, we have to make better choices and wiser choices, maybe not the most economical choices, but definitely better for the environment within itself. So that is the end of this section. Um, make sure that you have taken all your notes and then uh, your assignment is available to you on Canvas. Um, you can either submit it if you're a remote learner or you can hand it in in paper to me in class.